I'm Hugh Hewitt. Dr. Michael Oren, formerly the ambassador from Israel to the United States, formerly the deputy minister of Israel, has a new book out called 2048, The Rejuvenated State. Now, I flew down to Washington yesterday and I read the entire thing. And on the way back, I outlined a long interview with Dr. Oren. I've asked him to stick around for four segments. And he has come and he has joined me. Good morning, Dr. Oren. Welcome back to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Great to have you, Mr. Ambassador. Great to be with you, Hugh. Good morning. Now, when this arrived on the table, I had no idea what it was. And I, it's an interesting production. It's beautifully produced because it's in Hebrew from one end to the other and it's in English from one end to the other. But I read the whole thing in a single sitting of about two hour airplane flight. And I made a list of everything I did not know. And I, I do many people come up to you and say, Wow, I did not know that. And I know, you know, I'm not a dummy about Israel. It's not my country. It's not my land. But I read the Times of Israel every day. I talk to you once a week. I kind of know what's going on. But I did not know what a lot of this book was about. Um, just about everybody <laughs> comes up and says that. And uh, that's good news and bad news. Because the uh, good news is there. The bad news is that people should know about this. Different people who live in the state of Israel. Uh, the good news is that this book is about raising awareness. Uh, it's about getting a conversation going. And I just got to add one thing, uh, Hugh, and that is that, yes, it's in English and Hebrew, but in the middle, it's also in Arabic. And uh, that's that in itself is a statement. It's also addressed to the 21 percent of our population, which is Arab and Arabic speaking, uh, which uh, is very significant. I haven't seen a book like that ever, English, Hebrew and Arabic. Now, let me run down just my list of topics that we're going to cover, and then we're going to walk through them. First of all, it's a manifesto. I want to talk about its origins. I want to talk about a series of I don't know moments, including the most stunning paragraphs, which you might not be surprised, concern China on pages 53 to 54. I want to talk about the Bedouin, about which I knew zero. I want to talk about the ultra-Orthodox and the demographic problem, the education problem. I want to talk about the concentration wealth and the physical concentration of Israel, uh, I want to talk about the need to pull back from the legal brink, about the cost of buying a home and the moving to a rental model. I want to talk about two new medical schools and why, about the two-state situation embraced. I didn't know you had 100 monopolies. I didn't know you had huge regulatory overhang. I did not know that 20% of Israeli pay 92% of the taxes. That's a California situation there, That and that's a bad situation. Uh, I know about the separation of powers issues, and I know about the need for... Um, changes to the law, maybe not a new constitution, but I did not know about the Metropolitan Center proposal or the policing crisis or all sorts of stuff. That's my list. So where do you want it? Let's start with why a manifesto, why now, what's the origin of this book? The origin of this book started about three o'clock in the morning, five years ago, when I was the deputy minister to the prime minister, the same prime minister, Mr. Netanyahu, um, often we had conversations in the middle of the night because uh, Israeli politicians don't sleep. Our Knesset session has gone all night. We inherited this horrible institution from you guys. It's called a filibuster. And uh, and often Mr. Nisau likes to talk about books. And I would come down and talk to him. And as we say in vernacular, we would schmooze into the wee hours. Uh, and one night we had this conversation about our future. And the conversation went like this. We're so bogged down in our daily crises. And look how many crises we have right now. A crisis over the reform, a crisis over terror from Judea and Samaria, a crisis with the Iranians, a crisis with the Biden administration. So many different crises that we never get a chance to think about tomorrow. And not just tomorrow, we don't think long term. And I, I said to the prime minister, why don't we create a state commission that will look at Israel's future in every aspect, social policy, educational policy, foreign policy, Palestinians, Jews, Americans, everybody. Let's do it. And it's going to be a huge undertaking, but it'll be worth it. So he got very excited and gave me the green light to create this commission. Now, to create a commission like that, you have to go through a lot of legal acrobatics, the also of permissions. It took a year. And, of course, once all the permissions were granted, the government fell. <laughs> and, so, and so with this idea in mind, I turned to a good friend of mine, Natan Sharansky. You know him, you. Yes. And we took this project into a, a, a great institute in, in Jerusalem, the Hartman Institute. And for a year, we held discussions with leader thinker, leading thinkers in Israel on 2048. 2048 is, of course, Israel's 100th birthday. What Israel should look like on its 100th birthday from every aspect again. And it was a wonderful conversation, just riveting. And then COVID struck. And then it did that. 
And so like many, many millions of people, I retreated into my office. And uh, for want of anything better to do, I sat and began to write these ideas myself. And, uh, and once I started writing, I couldn't stop writing. And friends began to get interested in what I was writing, and they held Zoom conversations, and they created an NGO around this book. It's called uh, The Second Century, 2048, and uh, they actually produced this book. The book is not produced by me. It's produced by this NGO, and the idea of the NGO is the idea of the book. It's to get people talking about our future. And if I can just add this historical note, um, between the 1880s and the 1940s, this is the 60 years that were formative in the creation of the state of Israel, um, people engaged in a very heated debate over the future of that state. Was it going to be a socialist state, a capitalist state, a pro-Western state, a pro-Eastern state? Was it going to be religious, secular, democratic, autocratic? And those debates proved absolutely uh, crucial in determining the nature of the state. And we seem to have lost that ability. This is the whole idea here is to regain the ability to discuss, to talk about it. And what I did was put out my idea of what Israel should look like on its 100th birthday in terms of foreign policy, economic policy, every area. But I'm not trying to convince the reader that I'm right. I'm trying to get the reader, if anything, annoyed. <laughs> I want to well, I, I've got to say. Reader. Over a long life, I'm 67, and so I've been reading about Israel my whole life, and over many dozens of books, you and Amos Oz have impacted me the most. And Amos Oz is a man on the left, you're a man of the center. I don't know much about the, the people on the right. But I'm not dumb, but I'm pretty uh, curious. I just am stunned that I don't know thing. Let's just begin with an obvious thing. I didn't know anything about the Bedouin issue. I thought the Bedouins were kind of a charming subculture that existed out in the, in the Negev somewhere and didn't give anyone any problems and that Israel treated them with great deal of respect as a traditional people. And and then you introduce me in like chapter two, here are the issues and what are we going to do about the Bedouin? Why don't you just use that as a jumping off point to sort yeah, of illustrate one. what people don't know about Israel, even friends of Israel, not because I'm a Jew, not because... Uh, I'm a Zionist, but because I'm a fa I, I believe in American security and, and supporting our democratic allies. That's why I'm for Israel. But tell us about the Bedouin. Okay, that's an excellent place to start. And often people start there. You, not just you. That's the, that's the chapter that gets everyone really shocked. That's the jaw dropper. Uh, because like you, many people see the Bedouin in this romantic way, Sheikh of Araby, Lawrence of Arabia, yes. uh, tents, and cam tents and camels. Uh, and yet, as I make uh, clear in the book, the Bedouin actually presents an existential threat to the state of Israel. Existential threat. And, you know, there, there are several, but this is, what, this is one of the leading ones. What is it? I lived in the Negev uh, for years, and I watched the Negev disappear. And you so better you explain know, the Negev to the Steelers. Yeah, the Negev is, is south of Beersheba to a lot. It is 62% of the country is desert. It's one of the reasons why Israel is the most densely populated area in the world, north of Beersheba to Haifa, uh, that one swath of territory. They always say that, Haifa, that Gaza is the most densely populated area in the world. Uh, it's a lie. Uh, Tel Aviv is more, is tw more than twice as densely populated as Gaza is. Very densely populated, wow. but 62% is desert. So what's in the desert? You have a few Israeli cities like uh, Dumbona in Iran and Beersheba. Um, but what you have there is Bedouin. And nobody actually knows how many Bedouin there are. The, the number is, is actually kind of a secret. Um, but it's like this. You um, have in the bed, in south of Beersheba, you basically have no Israeli law. The Bedouin have uh, no control over uh, gun ownership. Guns are rampant. Drug and drug trade is rampant. Human traffic is rampant. But also rampant is polygamy. Now, polygamy is against the law in the state of Israel. But no, it's 1978. Do I remember the date correctly from my read? It, it, it was there outlawed by the laws Catholic. against polygamy. No, yep. no one's polygamy except for the Bedouin. And, uh, and the Bedouin, about 30% of Bedouin males have four wives. And it's not like Bedouin man, male falls in love with third wife. It's Bedouin male procures third wife. They're bought. It's kind of chattel slavery. And they're bought from many places throughout the Judean Samaria, even Gaza, even Jordan, even beyond that. They're procured. And what they do is they come and they work. Uh, they work brutally. The men don't work that hard. The women work. And they procreate. And they have very, very large families. So every individual Bedouin man can have a family of 40, 50, 60 kids. 
Uh, Israel has um, child subsidy payments uh, meant originally to replenish the Jewish people after the Holocaust so that a Bedouin man having 50 kids can sit there and get something about a half a million shekels of salary per month and do nothing other than that procreate. And, uh, and, and in addition, so you have this polygamy, you have with the wonderful Israeli uh, medical system, you have the, the largest, uh, largest population explosion in the world, the largest population growth in the world. And that could amount to hundreds of thousands of Bedouin in the Negev. But then the problems just begin. Just begin. There are in the Negev upwards of 400,000 illegal Bedouin structures. Now, Hugh, you come to my apartment in Jaffa in South Tel Aviv, and I build a, a, a one-foot addition to my balcony. I'm going to have the police there in an hour. They're going to give me a big ticket and summon me to court. In the, in the South, you can build an entire city, and no one's going to do anything because the police will say, we, we simply have not enough. The police, and we go in there, these people have guns, and they're trying to remove a couple of Bedouin structures, and, 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 and it starts a minor war. And the police simply don't have the ability to... Uh, to counter the illegal construction in the negative. And then it gets worse because the Bedouin over the past several decades have undergone a twin process. They have become Palestinian. They were never Palestinians before. The Palestinians didn't like them. They didn't like the Palestinians. Now they are Palestinian Bedouin and Palestinian nationalist Bedouin. And in addition, they have become Muslim. Now, the Bedouin were always Muslim, but they had their own form of sort of folksy Islam. It was like Sufism and very peaceful Islam, not political in any way. But over the recent decades, Hamas has made huge inroads there. And every Bedouin settlement, uh, illegal, most of them, has a nice green mosque in the middle of it. That's a sign of the southern Islamic movement, which is the Israeli equivalent of Hamas. And so now you have Palestinian Islamicist Bedouin. Uh, it's interesting that the party in the Knesset uh, last time called Ram, led by Mansour Abbas, and by the way, a, an interesting party, don't get me wrong, very interesting party, but it defined itself as a Palestinian Islamicist <laughs> Bedouin party. Stay, and, stay and right there. We've got to take a reason, break. We've got, we've got plenty of time, and I'm going to spend some time teasing this. I think every single synagogue ought to get this and use it for their discussion group. I think every Bible study out there ought to get this because this is the land of the scripture. But it is, it's so far looking forward and it's so stunning about stuff that people who say, I support Israel, have no idea that 2048, the rejuvenated state, is a must get. Stay tuned. Dr. Warren will be right back. I'm Hugh Hewitt. My guest is Dr. Michael Oren, former Israeli ambassador to the United States, frequent guest on The Hugh Hewitt Show, prolific author and wonderful guest. His brand new book is 2048, The Rejuvenated State, which I read yesterday on my back and forth to Washington, D.C. I made a long list. Dr. Oren, I, I, we put the Bedouin on the table. People have to read to, to learn what the problem is. I want to go a little bit up north now to the city of Abu Ghanash. Am I pronouncing that correctly? <laughs> Not exactly. What city are we talking about here? You know, where the uh, the Hamas is buying up the real estate, and it's the northernmost part of the Overlook. Um, what's it? Abu Ghosh. On oh, ABU. Abu Ghosh. Cap oh, Abu Ghosh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, um, look, you're dealing well, with a Goyim, and I can't say anything the right <laughs> way. So it's okay. <laughs> Abu Ghosh. Yes. Interesting. Tell us about place. that's another, huh? How could they let that that's happen? Fast. Exactly, exactly. Those of uh, those of listeners don't know Abu Ghosh is one of the most scenic and friendly, friendliest um, Arabic speaking villages in Israel. It's actually not an Arab. They don't consider themselves Arabs. They are Muslims from uh, Central Asia, uh, from the Caucasus region. Sort of, they form a, they form a they follow a Turkish form of Islam. Uh, they people in the village serve in the military. They serve in the police. In Israel's War of Independence, uh, Abu Ghosh sided uh, with the Jewish state against the invading Arab armies, and they've never been forgiven for it, by the way, by the Arabs. Now, that is significant enough, but much more significant is the geographical position of Abu Ghosh. It sits astride the main highway linking Tel Aviv uh, and Jerusalem, and it sits on the top of a mountain. And that mountain is the most strategically important mountain in the state of Israel, because not only does it control the highway from one side, on the other side, it overlooks our major airport, Ben Gurion Airport. It is at the top of that mountain where there is a large development project uh, for housing 
um, beautiful houses that have magnificent views, but the people in the village can't afford to buy those houses. Those houses are being bought by Palestinians from East Jerusalem, from across what you call maybe the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, and even, even in Gaza. Now, <laughs> should there be a war next sin soon? And um, I know from my, my uh, daughter-in-law is a, is a police officer. We know that the Israeli police and defense forces are preparing for the possibility that there would be internal violence in any war. That hilltop could be controlled by hostile forces, hostile forces that could close our highway and close our airport very easily. With a simple mortar, you could do it. And yet nobody's doing anything. The, the, and it. that leads to I'm just running down a litany. That's a unique yeah. problem. Maybe that yeah. can be solved by a piece of legislation. You know, it's not a, a unique problem. Americans understand you have a police problem. They are underpaid, overworked, and they are leaving in droves. I never yes. knew this. Yes, and you can't have sovereignty uh, without, without police. You know, one of the major points of the book is that uh, we, the Jewish people, were not sovereign for 2,000 years. And one glorious day in, in May 1948, we, found, we woke up and found ourselves the owner of a sovereign state. But we don't quite understand it. So there's no sovereignty, for example, south of Beersheba, 62% of the country. Uh, there's no sovereignty in stopping Palestinian building atop the most strategically important hilltop in the state of Israel. No sovereignty. And to understand sovereignty, you have to also have the ability to enforce your laws. Now, much to our credit, the, the Knesset pass, passes more pieces of legislation than just about any legislature in the world, about 4,000 laws a year in the state, in, in Knesset. I know I was voting all night till my finger fell off. Uh, that's wonderful. But we also have the almost the lowest level of enforcement of laws in the OACD. About only 35 percent of our laws are enforced. We talked about polygamy before. We talked about illegal building in the South. These are all violations of laws, gun ownership, drug trafficking, human trafficking, violations of laws. You cannot have enforcement unless you have enforcers. And I know the question of police in this country is a big issue. Unfortunately, in Israel, it's not big enough. An issue. Oh, 400,000 unlicensed weapons. Another stunner. I was under the impression that, like Australia, like Japan, the people who had guns had been issued the right to have guns, but apparently not. And Israel has one of the lowest levels of licensed guns in the world. Only 3% of Israelis have licensed guns, but illegal guns are, are rampant. And we see it now in the Arab communities where since the beginning of the year, over 100 Arabs have been killed in gun battles between rival clans and families and mafia groups. And four and, Israelis uh, were murdered at a gas station earlier this week. I covered that. Dr. Michael Orn is my guest. He's coming back because we have to talk about the economy, the basic law, the legal reform. I, I can't tell you if you're a friend of Israel, you ought to order uh, 2048, the rejuvenated state. Get a few copies for your book group. Talk about it at synagogue. Talk about it with your reading group. Talk about it with your friends. Send it to your family. It is spare, meaning it, it doesn't take but two hours to read the whole thing. And at the end of that, you'll be saying, how did I, why was I, why didn't I get the memo? Well, Michael Oren has written you the memo and you ought to go get the book. And this is a special edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show. Dr. Oren's going to hang around for two more segments so that I can alert people to this over the course of a longer podcast is run out. Go and get 2048. Look up uh, Dr. Michael Oren on Twitter or go to Amazon 2048 colon the rejuvenated state. Uh, I'm not sure the Steelers fans will remember that, but they ought to be able, be able to remember 2048. 100th anniversary of Israel. Put that in your head. What ought it to grapple with in the 25 years before then if it wants to be as healthy and vibrant in democracy then? We're going to talk about the economy and the China problem of great concern to Americans when we come back to hour number two of this Thursday morning edition from Studio North of the Hugh Hewitt Show. Uh, bonjour, hi, Canada, and greeting to my Finnish listener who called yesterday. I'm Hugh Hewitt, live inside of my studio north, holding this book, 2048, The Rejuvenated State, by my guest, Dr. Michael Oren, former ambassador to the United States from the state of Israel, former deputy minister, prolific author, and wonderful guy. Uh, and uh, surprising to me, he put out a book I didn't know about, but he sent me a copy this week called 2048, The Rejuvenated State, I read it yesterday, going back and forth to D.C., made a long list of notes and uh, imposed on him to spend four segments with me so that we can tell this audience to go out and get this book so they can learn about those problems that will confront Israel 
in the last 25 years of its first century. Roughly, you know, in, in the United States history, it would be about 1850, before our Civil War, right? As we made our way from 1776 to 1850, and we had to adjust a lot of things. Israel won't, we hope, have a civil war. But boy, do they have problems that the average American who supports the state of Israel don't, does not know about. Dr. Oren, how is the book being received by American Jewry? Because you speak on their behalf about the chief rabbin, what, uh, rabbin, I can't even say it, about issues that have to do with, you know, the tree of life not being a synagogue and who gets to make Aliyah and all that. How's it being received in America? Uh, very warmly. It depends on the congregation. Uh, for example, I spoke to here in, I'm in Boston right now. I spoke to two uh, modern Orthodox congregations. And the only pushback I get, is interesting, is that talking about the Bedouin situation and the ultra-Orthodox situation in the same breath. Uh, and they actually do stem to some of the same problems. And that, the problem with sovereignty, not quite understanding what it means to be a sovereign state. So while we don't enforce our laws vis-a-vis -vis the Bedouin, and that has created a strategic danger to the state of Israel, uh, we don't enforce our educational laws vis-a-vis -vis the ultra-Orthodox, where uh, the ultra-Orthodox children are getting an education that is usually at the second grade level, uh, very little math, no English, certainly no civics. And so when those young ultra-Orthodox children graduate, they cannot be part of the economy. Uh, never mind serving in the army. They can't even serve into the economy. We're a high, remember, we're a high-tech economy. And that is terrible enough today, but 25 years from now, one out of every two elementary school children will be ultra-Orthodox. And that is simply not a sustainable model for any modern state, not for the state of Israel. Now, so speaking them together in one breath sometimes annoys uh, people who are, are very religious, observant. Uh, and I always stress that I have great regard for the ultra-Orthodox. This is a, a population, perhaps the only population in the world that volunteers to be impoverished for what they believe. Um, and I have no desire to change their way of life. I just want them to educate their kids so that the state will survive. And, and so that when COVID comes, they are not ravages. They were. That's a fascinating chapter, but we've actually talked a little bit about that before. What we've never talked about is the strategic vulnerability that comes from concentration of the physical mass of the Israeli population. And you, I did not know there were only 22,000 uh, Jews on the Golan. I just, I, I, what? And because you know, I drove around what? there in the tour bus, and I, I said, what? And, and the concentration of the physical location in Tel Aviv is a strategic vulnerability, Dr. Oren. It is eggs in one basket, and our enemies know it. Believe me, that's why they're aiming for Tel Aviv all the time. And as I said earlier uh, in this broadcast, it's one of the most densely populated areas of the world. We're, we're vying with Wall Street, and, um, and we, you know, we build high, and uh, high buildings. Very, very densely populated, and P.S. the most expensive city on the planet. Uh, and we haven't talked about the the social gap in Israel. Israel has the biggest social gap between rich and poor of any country in the world outside of the United States, Chile, and Mexico. That and was that's really Palestine. amazing. That is really amazing because people think of it as being the socialist paradise and the kibbutz and this land is our land. And in fact. It's got a 1% problem that makes, you know, it's, it's America's 1% problem. You've got billionaires and tech startups, and you've got very smart people, and then you've got a huge underclass. A huge underclass. And, and uh, yes, we have marvelous universal health care. You don't have the health care problem you have in the United States. And we have uh, social nets. We don't have people living on the street. Uh, but poverty, uh, yes, poverty, a large chunk of it relates to the Bedouin population and the ultra orthodox population, which, you know, on the record, immediately they are born into poverty, uh, and that skews that that number so somewhat. But still, it's the it's a social gap, and it's getting deeper and it's getting wider, and has all sorts of political ramifications. You know, this big debate over the reform, where people are out in the streets, seven hundred thousand people out in the streets uh, protesting for democracy, and that's that's an extraordinary sight to see. People singing the national anthem and waving the flag, not like in the 60s where we were burning the flag, if you remember that, you know, and spitting at soldiers. Um, it's all love, but who? 700,000 people out protesting. There's 9.3 million people not protesting, and a lot of those people belong to the working class. And they will say, and this is the people in my neighborhood in South Tel Aviv, they'll say, this is about, these protests aren't about democracy, they're not about freedom, it's about privilege. And these people are protesting to, to preserve 
the power that they lost at the polls, and they lost the polls to the to the working class, mostly from Eastern background, uh, traditional, and the people protesting are rallying around the last great bastion of Ashkenazi, Western uh, elitism, which is the Supreme Court. And it's interesting, 14 out of our 15 judges are Ashkenazi and not Sephardi, don't come from the East, even though the majority of Jews in the state of Israel are Sephardi. All right, we're going to so do some hopscotch poll- here because I've got some key points I want people to put in their head. 90, 92% of Israeli taxes are paid by 20% of the people in Israel. That inevitably leads to a California-like exodus of talent and tech brains. I was unaware of the brain drain from Israel until I read 2048, but that's a real problem, Dr. Oren, when you're, when you're loading all the taxes. As Pete Wilson used to say, when five people are pulling the wagon and there's one in it, that's great. But when one person is pulling the wagon and there are five people in it, that's not great. And Israel has put itself in that position now. How? I thought Netanyahu yeah. liberated the economy. And he did as a treasury minister. He did a great job. Uh, as the prime minister, we've lost a lot, a lot of ground here. Uh, not the least of which is this present government has given an impressive number of budget, size of a budget, to the ultra-Orthodox education system, which is frankly a, a suicidal policy. Uh, long term for the state of Israel. And yes, it's remarkable. You know, in terms of OECD, uh, we have one of the lowest immigration rates in the world, people leaving. But you have to look at not just the numbers, you have to look at who's leaving. Yep. And who is leaving are the scientists, the doctors. Go to any university in this, in this country, see how many Israelis you have on the, on, on the faculty. Uh, how many Israelis do your listeners have in their, in their communities? You know, um, Los Angeles, uh, the Valley is the third largest Israeli city in the world. There's probably a million Israelis living, at least living in the United States alone. And who are these people? Many of them are professionals. And uh, on one hand, this is actually a sign of the success of the state of Israel, because uh, there's only so many physicists and so many <laughs> doctors we can employ. Um, and so, there's, you know, there's spillover. But a lot of people leave because because they they're, uh, they can't afford housing. Uh, that we have a, the second most expensive grocery basket in the world after Japan. Uh, it's interesting, the Israelis I meet outside of Israel don't leave because of Hamas rockets. They leave because of internal issues, particularly economic issues. And, yeah, and, not- and buying a house is one, I want to make sure I get this point down, because we're going to come back and talk about China, because that's the thing that upset me. Everything else is a revelation. I said, oh my gosh, I got to slam Dr. Oren about this. But, mm-hmm. but, the, you know, if you were in the United States still and you were still a, a, a voting member, you would be a, a, a center left Democrat. And you kind of think that you ought to move to the German and other model of rental as opposed to home ownership because home ownership is such a nightmare. What is the plan? Because you can't you can't price everybody out of a house there. And you really the rental model doesn't increase individual wealth ever. Well, I was part of a party for four years. We worked to try to take down housing prices. State of Israel, and guess what? We failed. The <laughs> prices are because they're like twice as, as high as when we started. And why? First of all, a, a good reason Israel has the highest natural birth rate of any industrialized country. And most industrialized countries, including this country, have a negative birth rate. Uh, ours is very, very high. And we're short about 50, 60,000 apartments every single year. And then, remember, I said uh, we're, we're, we're basically building in 38% of the popula- of the country, but 62% is. Uh, desert, and ev- all of our materials have to be imported. And so housing prices are very, very, uh, very high. And also most of the land is state-owned land. And the state gets a tremendous amount of money by by having high housing prob- uh, prices and land prices. So you put that all together and you have a housing crisis. Now there are solutions, not the least of which is actually expanding the population, start building in the negative. Hey, in the United States, you can build, you can build Phoenix, can't you? You can build in the desert. Yeah. Uh, we should be building different cities in the desert and expanding out. But to do that, you need infrastructure and you need jobs. Um, the Golan Heights, a huge, beautiful area, 22,000 Jews, as you said. Um, you build infrastructure, you build jobs, they will come. I will be right back. One more segment with Dr. Oren because Honestly, we're going to have a conversation about Israel and China that Dr. Oren is very blunt about, and I'm not very happy about, but it's good to talk about it. Don't go anywhere, America. 
2048 should be on your shelf. Go to Amazon.com. 2048, the rejuvenated state. Order it today, and I'll be right back with Dr. Oren. Hugh Hewitt talking with Dr. Michael Oren about his brand new book, 2048, the rejuvenated state. The podcast today will cover all the four segments I have with Dr. Oren. Dr. Oren, Chairman Gallagher of the Select Committee on Engagement with the Chinese Communist Party, good friend of mine. I'm going to recommend they hold a field hearing in Israel to discuss pages 53 and 54 of your book, because it is clear that the depth and breadth of the engagement of the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Republic of China in Israel is much broader than I knew. You write, surprisingly, quote, China is certainly not a hostile country. You suggest that America's position is that Israel cannot have its American pie and Chinese rice cake, uh, rice cake too. Ultimately, we must choose. And your admonition is we must navigate. My admonition is you got to cut ties. Uh, they're bad guys. They have a genocide underway. The Jewish state cannot be dealing with a genocidal dicta- dictatorial system. On the other hand, you got some practical problems here. They build everything. They build everything. They're building our northern port, our southern port. They're building the subway system across the street from me. Uh, they're building about half the city, the towns, half the buildings in Tel Aviv. And we talked about the acute housing shortage. They build twice as fast as everybody, half as expensively as everybody. And Israel's desperate for more Chinese workers. You get up in the morning, in my neighborhood, it looks like Shanghai. <laughs> All the guys with yellow, you know, yellow hard hats and bicycles, um, Chinese. And this is a time when America is withdrawing strategically from the Middle East. The Chinese have built the largest naval base in Africa at the, at the entrance to the Red Sea. They're controlling the Red Sea. They're building two bases on the uh, shores of the Persian Gulf. And I think, if I'm a betting man, they will be rebuilding Syria. You know, the UN price tag for Syria, about $300 billion. The Iranians can't do it. The Russians can't do it. You're going to see the Chinese are going to be building the, the most important you know, keystone state in the Middle East, in Syria. So we can't ignore this. We can't ignore it economically. We can't ignore it strategically. And uh, and yet, as you said, we got to make the choice between you know the rice cake and the American apple pie. And uh, and that's a very hard case. And I've sat through meetings with three administrations now where representatives of the United States have said, you got to make that choice. And they've said to us that the Chinese build the Haifa port. Uh, the U.S. 6th Fleet will not visit Haifa port. Uh, and these are very tough calls for the leadership of the state of Israel. Uh, and I, 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 it's a long conversation. I just want people to know it has surfaced here. Israel has been blessed by gas. There is a chapter in here about Israel's commitment to the care and preservation of its land, which is, of course, extreme. Desalinization is farther advanced there. You can clean up the Jordan. You can revive the Dead Sea. You can do all this if you've got a plan. But first, you've got to begin with political reform, because the Knesset is a nightmare, Dr. Oren, and you describe why. But you are against a constitution. You just want some amendments to the basic law, correct? That's correct. And we're not going to get a constitution. I don't think you get people in Philadelphia today to agree on American constitution. And you're not going to get the, you know, the Israeli settler and the ultra orthodox Jew and the Arab and the communist to sit in the room and get a constitution. So let's forget about a constitution. And we actually exist because we're very flexible and we have these laws. We have to just take these laws uh, more seriously. Um, and I want to stress, and I don't know how much time we have. Uh, about two minutes. Uh, Hugh, because oh, so it's very important to end on a, on a positive note, because this is actually a positive book at the end. Yes, it is. Uh, and and it's, about, it's about optimism, it's about hope. I define Zionism with one word, and that's responsibility, taking responsibility for ourselves. None of the problems we've mentioned are without solutions. And most of the solutions aren't rocket science. They aren't. Whether it's uh, expanding the police, applying our laws, forcing the ultra-Orthodox school system to teach kids mathematics, um, building outside of the greater Tel Aviv area. There are actually solutions to all of these Two new problems. medical schools. You take responsibility. Yeah. And I've yeah. been living in Israel a long time, 45 years. And I've seen this country transformed from a lower middle class agrarian society where our largest export item was oranges to today when we're a, we're a superpower. We're listed among the superpowers of the world. I've seen a million Jews come from the former Soviet Union. I've seen 100,000 Jews come from Ethiopia. I've seen miracles in my life. It can be done if we are aware and if we take responsibility. That's the thrust of this book. And it begins with discussing these issues one another and not sweeping them under the park carpet. How do people get you to come to their town, their synagogue, to talk about 2048, the rejuvenated state? Ah, very simple. <laughs> you can contact my right hand, very right hand, Tammy, Tammy, T-A-M-M-Y, at michaelorin.org. 
I, I think no this point. is you're going to be in the states a long time on this book tour, aren't you? Um, I'm back and forth pretty much every month. Well, it, it is a fine project. I appreciate your sending it to me. I had no idea you were on this work. By the way, what does your friend, the prime minister, think about it? <laughs> I don't know. He's rather bogged down. Right yeah, but if there's a call for term limits in the prime ministership here. You know, the, that only works if the, you give the current prime minister the right to go as long as they want. Well, that law wouldn't be retroactive. But, yes, certainly should have time limits. You have time limits for everything. Um, and that, that's crucial. You have them in, this, in, in the United States, and, and they're important. That was George Washington's great contribution. Saying enough was enough. Well, and, I, I uh, think it's a... It's not since Amos Oz has a book hit me between the eyes about the future of the state of Israel as this one does. And it's not all uh, Hezbollah and Hamas. It's about the internal issues as well as state security that Israel must deal with. The book is 2048, The Rejuvenated State. Dr. Warren, thank you for a, a huge dollop of your time and getting up early. I appreciate it very much.